we have another big topic to get to, and that was this whole controversy that came up recently over this doctor. What's his name? Peter Hotez. Yeah, Peter Hotez. Refusing or declining to debate RFK Jr. Yeah, I mean, I thought this was uh, an important thing to cover for us because what Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has done by entering the race is kind of put the expert class on the defensive, whether it's the experts who claim to personally embody the science or it's the so-called experts on foreign policy and international security uh, and, and national security. And Peter Hotez is someone who kind of played second fiddle to Anthony Fauci. He was Fauci's hype man throughout the COVID event working CNN and MSNBC and hyping up every initiative that was required of him in order, you know, either to attack Trump on lockdowns and demand harder lockdowns, support the UK's lockdown, uh, which was based on phony data, or to uh, create momentum for vaccine mandates by demanding that everyone, including two-year-olds, needed to have two doses and essentially lying to the public and discrediting himself again and again and again without any scrutiny. He was a seminal figure. And when you see him on any MSNBC interview, he's wearing his lab coat. Like he just got out of the lab doing experiments. He's like, I just wafted the beaker and I have enough time to give you Ari Melber and Mehdi Hassan to tell you about the science. It's like Zelensky wearing his GI Joe outfit a guy who has no military experience and their authority is conveyed to the public through their costume in order to get us in line with the official agenda. So Peter Hotez was an extreme, extremely influential figure, but he's also someone who's taken it upon himself to attack and discredit what he calls vaccine skeptics or anti-vaxxers and people who are spreading anti-science in his word. And so he set his sights on RFK Jr., attacking him again and again and again on Twitter. So it was, I think Elon Musk ponied up $100,000 and said, I'll give a hundred grand to the charity of your choice if you go on Joe Rogan and debate RFK Jr. And now the whole expert class and all the pundits and the Mehdi Hassans are, de are de declaring that he should absolutely not do that and not debate. Oh. Peter Hotez, time, sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> Peter Hotez is a professional public speaker, and he's afraid of debating someone with a literal speech impediment who has a uh, problem speaking, who is running for president, who represents the views of everyone that Peter Hotez claims to hate, and he's refusing to get in the lion's den. And Mehdi Hassan is the author of the book uh, about how to win every argument. So yeah. and he's always he's always bragging about how he loves to debate and blah blah blah. So here, so he's advocating, he, he's advocating that there not be a debate between in this one particular case. That's just really funny. But not yeah, surprising. yeah. I mean, he had Peter Hotez on his show to allow him to explain why debating was such a terrible idea in this case. Let's just review some of the lies that Peter Hotez told throughout the COVID event. Uh, this is a video by our friend Matt Orfalia, and uh, I don't know if we're going to have time to play the whole thing, but you'll get the point. We're not hearing a lot about is the unique potential safety problem of coronavirus vaccines. And then something changed. Is any vaccine released by emergency use authorization by the FDA is an outstanding uh, vaccine. J&J's vaccine has a risk of life-threatening blood clots. When you hear the beep, that's the sound of safety. So don't overthink it. Uh, they're they're both really good. Back, they're all really good vaccines. Get vaccinated now. You got to call now. If you wait, uh, it's going to be really too late to protect your child. If this was your child, what happens next could make it the worst day of your life. So even though COVID poses zero threat to healthy children, vaccinate your children. Do the right thing. Be safe and not sorry. I'm strongly recommending for adolescents to get their two doses of vaccine and fully immunized after those two doses. Advanced technology that can help save lives. This is going to be a long-lasting vaccine. A long-lasting vaccine. A few moments later. We're seeing that two doses is not holding up well for emergency room visits. It's not holding up well for hospitalizations. Here we go again. again. 
everyone's going to need a booster. You need that third immunization. Triple the amount. Get that third immunization. The two mRNA vaccines were always a three-dose vaccine. The two mRNA vaccines were always a three-dose vaccine. We've, I've always said this is a three-dose vaccine. We've, I've always said this is a three-dose vaccine. This is a three-dose vaccine. But I'm not done yet. That third immunization, the problem is it's not holding up. So we may have to look at sort of innovative solutions. Oh God, not this again. A fourth immunization, oh boy. just just to keep them to keep them going, to keep the country uh, going. We have to consider some out of the box things. A fourth immunization. <laughs> Four. A fourth immunization. Get that second boost. A second boost to keep the country uh, going. I've made that recommendation. A fourth immunization. All right. Well, I could just keep going on. I mean, if we were to follow his schedule, it would be like the sixth now. But the bivalent booster. Uh, I mean, no one's even promoting that anymore. And I think less than 15% of the American public is even taking boosters. It's gotten to the point where like Michael Phelps is doing ads for Pfizer, where he said that he has to take a booster because he suffers from depression and uh, Questlove suffers from weight loss or weight gain. And that puts them at special risk from COVID. But the point is Peter Hotez has never been held accountable. He also was pushing lockdowns, which have done enormous damage especially to poor and vulnerable populations caused learning loss for an entire generation especially public school students opioid addiction off the charts homelessness evictions and uh you know the, there's a whole swath of the public and i know a lot of the liberal left laptop class isn't very familiar with this part of the public known as the working class that they fetishize but they are <laughs> extremely extremely angry at fauci and hotez and they want this moment for someone to hold them accountable since they're not going to be criminally prosecuted for what they did. Uh, three hours in, in Joe Rogan's garage in Austin, Texas would be cathartic, I think, for that part of the public. Or Hotez could actually hold his own, but he won't do it. So it's really exposed um, to that swath of the public what these uh, so-called experts really about. And you know, what I've noticed in a lot of the uh, critiques of Hotez is that people are pulling from so many different sources. There are just so many videos of him lying. Or I, I just looked up Peter Hotez lockdown on Twitter and I found him saying, Boris Johnson is doing a great job with the lockdown. By the way, Boris Johnson has just faced a parliamentary condemnation for his own role in breaking lockdown. Uh, and then a week or like three weeks later, Peter Hotez declares that real scientists don't use the term lockdown. It's a phony term, except he just used it to call for one. It's just like you can just and this is just like all the foreign policy experts we deal with. They're all complete frauds. They derive their sense of credibility from their phony costumes, whether it's, uh, you know, a, a, a well-tailored suit at the Brookings Institution yeah. or the lab coat and from the plaudits and a and acceptance that they receive from fellow affluent liberals who uh, claim to hold credentials. It's not credibility from the public or the that their predictions ever came true. So Let me I think Hope is an easy target here. Let me give an example of the kind of hypocrisy and just partisan hackery that I totally get why people are livid at this guy. So here he is, Hotez. He's talking about... Uh, Alex Jones. Alex Jones will attend anti-COVID vaccine protests here in Houston. Can you imagine people going so far down this anti-vax rabbit hole, jeopardizing their lives, the lives of their kids, lives for what? Uh, and so this is the you know the classic line we got that whenever like in Florida where people were gathering outside or going to you know any kind of like in any kind of conservative or Republican uh, gathering or area, this was like they were endangering everybody. But then when you had the Black Lives Matter protests, which people like Peter Hotez, who are Democratic Party partisans, they don't care about Black Lives Matter. They cared about these protests because they could instrumentalize them for Biden's reelection. That's why yeah. Democratic hacks were cheering them on. So here he says this. Uh, I explained why it's not so simple to just say protests will bring back COVID-19. Rather, structural racism causes three times higher COVID-19 death rates in the African-American population and rates already increasing in many states. So when it's Republicans, conservatives gathering during COVID, they're killing themselves. These are like mass killing gatherings. When it's protests that can be exploited to help reelect Joe Biden, all of a sudden it's actually in the interest of public health for these protests to gather. And how can you 
look at that and take these people seriously. Uh, it's such an abuse of science. It's such a blatant abuse of science. So well, I, yeah, they're I, discrediting uh, the scientific to the extent there is a scientific establishment. These characters during the COVID event have solidly discredited it. They're discrediting uh, the vaccination schedule with their support for vaccines that young children and adolescents did not need the mRNA emergency use vaccines for COVID. They're discrediting you know, yeah. the, the yeah. normal vaccine schedule. And that's what this debate was, is going to be about. Ultimately, it's going to come down to the vaccine schedule itself. And that's, that's an own goal on Hotez's part, who's tried to avoid people like RFK throughout his whole life while attacking them. This is when I first heard of Hotez, because uh, he, he, here he is Russia gating. Yeah. I don't claim to have the answers, but ultimately it was the anti-science disinformation campaign from the Russian government together with the with whatever it is uh, and national that massively expanded the deaths from COVID-19 in America. So here he is blaming the Russian government, the Kremlin for vaccine skepticism in the U S which he then in turn says led to ex deaths, more deaths from COVID-19 in that's just Russia gating to the max. And when I saw that, I knew I could never take this guy seriously ever again. Uh, if he's yeah. that much of a hack to do something like that. Well, I just found this, Aaron, uh, from the Bullet of Atomic Scientists. This is an interview with uh, Peter Hotez. I think Russia is probably the most egregious perpetrator of, you know, of uh, spreading anti-vaccine rhetoric. Using they had a vaccine they had to, divide, own, to divide they the country. Vaccine. They had their own vaccine. Yeah, well, they yeah they had the Sputnik vaccine, and and you know the Russian sovereign investment fund sponsored it. So basically the Russian government had a financial stake in making sure that as many people in the country of in the Russian Federation got vaccinated with it and that they were able to export it abroad. And they were freaking out about their own population, not wanting that vaccine, uh, which yeah. also, you know, just like ours didn't prevent transmission or in infection. Um, but the Russian government, the Kremlin itself had a very strong stake in getting everyone to take yeah. their vaccines. Um, so the he's, US here even, he's saying, the sorry. US even pressured, the U.S. even pressured Ukraine not to accept the Russian vaccine. Like a, one of Putin's allies in Ukraine brokered a deal where Russia was going to supply all these free vaccines to Ukraine. And the State Department pressured Zelensky not to accept it. So, I mean, if, you're, if, you're, if your metric is vaccine skepticism, it was in fact the U.S. that was pushing vaccine skepticism. <laughs> In places like Ukraine, because again, they like they're so opposed to not that they had any safety concerns about the Russian vaccine. That's hard to take seriously. Yeah. They didn't want to do anything that could foster ties between Russia and Ukraine. So and Zelensky caved to that. Well, here's Peter Hotez actually discussing how he lobbied the Biden administration to bring in Homeland Security, the Commerce Department, the Justice Department and the State Department to investigate vaccine skepticism as a secret Russian plot. Wow. I mean, this is wow. just bonkers, absolutely bonkers. And he's complaining that even the Biden administration hasn't done this. I mean, what, what, what did he actually bring to the table other than disinformation, hysteria, calls for uh, increasing the security state to investigate Americans who have no connection to Russia as possible Russian assets, nothing. And, and so it's, it's no wonder that he wants to hide and pretend this whole thing didn't happen. And the reason that he's being defended by the expert class is the same reason that Christopher Steele was defended with a fawning profile in the New Yorker by Jane Mayer, why uh, Adam Schiff is being defended, why John Durham is being attacked. It's the same reason uh, that they discredited themselves on the same basis and they can't accept public scrutiny. Everyone who, who attacks them, by the way, is a fascist, an authoritarian uh, who supports autocracy. They can just dismiss it all. And that's why, you know, I thought it was so important for me to at least get in Rachel Maddow's face and try to ask her about some of this because she never, ever will subject herself to debate or public scrutiny. I mean, Aaron, you tried to debate so many people 
uh, who have attacked you on Twitter. Um, you, and you did actually, back in the day, you managed to get Ned Price, who was the State Department spokesman, to debate you on Russiagate. I mean, you're, we're, we're open for debate. We didn't, I don't think anyone paid him. <laughs> no, certainly not. No, no. And I'm sure he likes, I'm sure he does not want that video to exist on the internet. Oh, not because we're debating, because I just don't think they want to acknowledge that we even exist because they can't tolerate a countervailing point of view, a dissenting narrative. And, and, but they've been successful. If you look at the, look at the level of debate we saw about the Ukraine proxy war in, even in progressive media, you just, you weren't allowed to say the things we were saying. Uh, I mean, yeah. you experienced, you, you, I mean, you've experienced that with every issue you've you covered from Syria to COVID. There's just no yeah. tolerance. Well, even Palestine. Palestine. I mean, yeah. Right. When, when your own colleagues at the nation and tried to have you canceled. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's, well, that's here's, a, here's a tweet that really sums it all up from Ian Bremer. The main reason an expert shouldn't debate RFK Jr. on vaccines is that he has no expertise on the issue. It would be like me debating Elon on electric vehicles or him debating me on international relations. There's no value <laughs> added. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. I, I love it when people claim to have some sort of like scientific expertise when it comes to politics, as if politics is governed by rules. Like, yeah. as if it's, like the term political science even to me is so funny as if it's like <laughs> science that only this like enlightened group of experts like Ian Bremer can master. That is so funny. That is so funny. Wow. Oh, yeah. I mean, and Ian Bremer clearly hasn't mastered it. I mean, you just look at just look at, you know, search Ian Bremer, Syria, and you'll just find the laziest tweets that play on the prejudices of his buddies in Davos. They don't provide any insight into what's really happening in Syria. He'll just tweet, you know, those, those stupid uh, English language signs in Kafra novel uh, that'll be like, Mr. Biden, you have not bombed Syria and we really regret this. Pete, uh, Ian Bremer will tweet those out. Like they're just like, this is what Syrians think and we're not doing it. Like he doesn't realize Ride Faris was the guy who was um, writing those signs and he was sponsored entirely by USAID. Kafranabo was in Idlib, which has been captured by Al Qaeda thanks to U.S. weapons, and that Raid Faris was actually eventually killed by Al Qaeda and company uh, because he wasn't extreme enough. But he was just a U.S. A asset. That's all he was. You're not going to get that from Ian Bremmer. You're not. He was a total Russia Gate fanatic. I mean, I, I think anyone watching this right now, anyone in the chat, could run circles around Ian Bremmer. Of course, um, because because you you're willing to look at the world as it is, and he depends entirely. He runs a risk management company, so it means he depends on his clients paying him, and he depends on the approval of his buddies. I mean, he's kind of so I he's kind of like the Peter Hotez of international relations. I mean, this is him. This is just like a tweet he made unironically. Here's, yeah, a portrait of an expert. Closing out Davos, drinks with Chancellor Schultz. <laughs> you know, just a few months after Nord Stream was bombed. This is like the expert. This is this is the source of his expertise is that he has drinks with Olaf Schultz, <laughs> the German cuckmeister. Uh, here's another expert. Just going back to Ukraine for one second. Uh, yeah. Andrea Kendall Taylor, you know, prominent think tanker. I think she served in the government under Obama, I believe. She has a new article out in Foreign Affairs talking about how she's still talking about not only Ukrainian victory, but also how Ukrainian victory could lead to regime change in Moscow. That's the argument of her piece, is how Ukrainian victory could lead to regime change in Moscow. The same fantasy that neocons have been pushing for the past decade. And meanwhile, on the, on the ground, we talked about it in the earlier segment about how actually horribly things are going for Ukraine. But this is, these people are so delusional. They are completely, they're infected by a disease, like this, like this, like Russophobic disease, where all they can think about, they're obsessed with regime changing Putin, because Putin represents defiance to the US led order. And it colors everything they write. And so here, this is a former US official in the top US foreign policy journal actually talking about. Not only the prospect of Ukrainian success, which is not happening on the ground, 
but also how fantasizing that that could actually lead to Putin's overthrow when actually Putin right now is in a pretty strong position. It's just the delusion is incredible, but that's what it takes to be a so-called international expert in Washington. Yeah, actually, I read I suffered through Ann Applebaum and Jeffrey Goldberg's counteroffensive propaganda article. And Ann Applebaum says that the counteroffensive is important because it will lead to regime change, not just in Moscow, but in Belarus and Venezuela. She actually <laughs> said that we need to do this to support Democrats in Venezuela. It explicitly says that. And she says that when Putin's replaced, it doesn't matter if he will be replaced with an ultra-nationalist lunatic because the ultra-nationalist lunatic will be weaker and will, all we want to do is weaken Russia. Wow. So she's wow. t you know, accepted as an expert. And what, what this all comes down to is that these people are the biggest proliferators of disinformation and conspiracy theories and that their conspiracy theories and disinformation has more real world consequences than anything that we or RFK Jr. could say. I'm not saying we're spreading conspiracy theories. We spread conspiracy facts and we do conspiracy an analysis. Yeah. Um, but we're not in power. We're not in a position of authority. Peter Hotez was effectively in a position of authority to actually affect real world harm. And so these people need to be held accountable in public forums, if not uh, prosecuted. <laughs> I mean, like, I mean, you had, you had, uh, you've, you've had people prosecuted for incitement, incitement to war with lies, whatever. Let's, let's debate. So if Ian Bremmer were to respond to me calling him the Peter Hotez of international relations, mm -hmm. I would invite him to debate right here. And he would say no. Will never happen. Will never happen. Will never I mean, happen. yeah. I mean, we saw it during Russia Gate. During Russia Gate, you couldn't even debate the question of whether or not Trump was a Russian asset. That was just taken to be gospel. That's truth. If you question it, you are beyond the pale. You're spreading Russian disinformation, and you can't even be acknowledged. And that's that's just how it operated. And if you can't even debate something that dumb, that Trump is engaged in a sprawling conspiracy with Russia and has been blackmailed with a P tape ever since he was the host of The Apprentice, like. How are you yeah. gonna how are you gonna debate anything else? You can't. Uh, but we're gonna we're gonna do what we can to at least bring facts to the spreaders of disinformation. Mm -hmm.